Grab your Bibles, go back to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. If you guys can hear me, that's all that matters. I can barely hear myself. But Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. And for those of you guys that are visiting us for the first time or you're not regular attendees, we're currently going through the book of Matthew, okay? We're going through the book of Matthew chapter by chapter. And so we're up to Matthew chapter 4. We're up to Matthew chapter 4. Look at verse number 3. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. The Bible says, And when the tempter came to him, that came to Jesus, and said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And the title of the sermon this morning is, When the tempter came. When the tempter came. And if you know the context of this story, who's the tempter? Anybody want to answer that? Who's the tempter? It's the devil. It's Satan. Okay? And we know when Jesus Christ was walking on this earth, the tempter came. Satan came. The devil came. Tempting the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, if, if, if Satan is able to try to tempt Christ, guess what he's going to do to you? He's going to try to come to tempt you. Okay? Satan's going to find his way. Or maybe not Satan or many of his other devils that are with him. Hey, look, there's enough temptation of man in your heart, okay? You already have the fallen sinful nature in you. You're already tempted to sin because of that sinful nature. But it's so much harder when Satan himself comes and the devil himself comes bringing temptation to you. Hey, but look, if you sin, when you commit sin, you can't blame the devil. And I see Christians do this all the time. They say, well, the devil made me do it. It was the devil that caused me to sin. No. Yeah, he can come and tempt you. Hey, it's not sinful to be tempted, but when you carry out that sin, that's on you, buddy. Okay, when you sin, that's your decision to sin. You could either decide not to, to walk in the Spirit, obey the commands of God, or give in to your fleshly lust, to give in to the pride of life, to give to your the pride of, um, uh, what are they, the pride of life. Uh, it's your decision to give in to those temptations. You cannot blame the devil for that. But there's a reality that we need to understand is that the devil does come to tempt the children of God. Okay? So let's pick up the story in verse number 1. Verse number 1. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So the first thing I want you to understand about Jesus, it was the Holy Spirit, it was the Holy Ghost that led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. Okay, it was important that Jesus would face temptation because we know Jesus Christ was without sin. We know that he's a perfect Lamb of God. And it's important for us to read about temptation and knowing full well he was unable, he was incapable of giving in to those temptations. Okay, because it is impossible for God to sin. And if Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if he's God the Son, that means it is impossible for Christ to to sin. And it's so important that he would be that sinless Lamb of God who took on our sin, sin, who became sin for us, who paid the penalty of our sin on the cross so we can go free. It was important that Christ would be sinless. All right? Now look at verse number two. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. Hey, Jesus Christ fasted for 40 days, 40 nights. I've only met like Maybe one or two people who have told me they fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And it's a big task to do such a thing. You know, obviously Jesus Christ would have been drinking water because you can't, you can't go 40 days without drinking water. But obviously he went without food, okay? And it was important that he was nourishing the spirit, okay? He was, uh, you know, taking down the flesh and nourishing the spirit within him. Now notice this, it says Jesus was, was hungry. Of course he would be. Okay, if any of you have fasted any period of time, you know, you get to a point where you're hungry. <laughs> All right? You're hungry. And look at verse number three. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God. Now, hold on. Was Jesus the Son of God? Absolutely. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that he was the Son of God. But it's the devil, it's a tempter that comes and asks the question, If thou be the Son of God. Okay, you, so you know the devil when he comes to you, 
is always making you ask questions. Hey, instead of taking the Bible at face value, he wants you to ask if there'll be. Is that right? Is that the answer? Is that really what the Bible says? Is the Bible really against homosexuality and same-sex marriage? Yes, it is. It's not. Is it? No, it is. Okay? There are so many sins in the Bible. The Bible makes clear these things are sins. But the devil comes along and says, but is it really? Who, you know, who's that harming? No. You know, the Bible's black and white. We take the Word of God as it is, and the Word of God tells us that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, but we see the devil immediately casting doubt on the Word of God. But look, it says, if thou be the Son of God, command of these stones be made bread. Now, your first thought might be, wow, the devil's really caring. I mean, Jesus is hungry, right? And the devil's just telling Jesus, hey, just make these stones into bread. Hey, surely, I mean, he knows that Jesus wants to eat. And let me say to you guys, is that when, when, when Satan, when the devil comes tempting you, it's not going to be for the most wicked things that's out there. It might appear that the devil is trying to nourish you. It might appear that he's asking you to do something good. All right? Now, you would think, yeah, Jesus is hungry. He wants to eat. What's so wrong about, you know, making these, these stones into bread? But here's what you need to understand. Here's what you need to understand. Actually, what's the the ends doesn't justify the means. Okay? The ends does not justify the means. You might, see, you might see something that is good, like Jesus here eats and eating bread is good, nothing wrong with that. But then to carry out the means would be that he would be obedient to the devil. Yeah, don't you think if the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, don't you think that God will provide for his son? Don't you think God will make the best? and make sure that Jesus would be nourished and looked after once his time is done? Of course! But here comes the devil saying, Hey, let's do it right now. Obey me rather than obey God. Okay? So be careful about the devil. It's very tricky. He comes appearing like he's trying to help you. But instead he's trying to take your focus away from the Word of God. Hey, when the Holy Spirit leads you in life, when it's black and white for you, this is what God wants for me, then pursue it. Don't find an evil way to, to make the same e uh, me means met. If God is leading you, He's going to provide every way, He's going to open every door for you to be able to accomplish that task that He's leading you into. Okay? Yeah, the first thing about the devil, and, and you don't need to turn there, but in Genesis chapter 3, in Genesis chapter 3, you know the story of Adam and Eve? When the snake, when the serpent came, that was the devil, when the serpent came. And remember, God commanded Adam and Eve, they could not eat of the tree. Uh, eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What does Satan say to Eve in Genesis 3 verse 1? I'll read it to you quickly. It says, <clears throat> Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? You know, that is the devil's way, guys. When you start doubting the word of God, it's the devil that's put that in you. Okay? It's put those doubts in your mind. Okay? There's going to be times in your life when you read the Bible, you know, you're going to be like, hold on, this doesn't seem right. You know, and you're asking questions. Hey, it's the devil that's planted seeds of doubt in your mind. And you need to make a decision, am I going to go with the doubts against the Bible, with the devil? Or am I just going to believe what the Word of God says? I'm going to believe what God said in His book. Alright? You need to make that decision. And then in verse number 2, it says, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruits of the trees of the garden. But of the fruits of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And look at the serpent. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Again, you see the doubting of God's word. Okay? Denying what God has said. God told Adam and Eve, If you partake of that fruit, you will die. And we know that they did. That they disobeyed the commands of God. But how did they die on that day? Did they die physically? 
No, they died spiritually, okay? They died spiritually and they were in sin. And they knew they was in sin, but they had a shame of their nakedness toward God. And later on, you know, when we read the rest of the Bible, we read how God had provided coats of skin to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve. Okay? God had to kill an animal, take the skin of that animal, shed the blood of that animal to cover the nakedness and shame of Adam and Eve. And let me say to you guys now, as we celebrate Christmas, as we celebrate the birth of Christ, why did Christ come into this world? So that He would be the one that would shed His blood for our sins. Okay? That His righteousness would cover our shame and nakedness, as it were. Our, our sinful nature. And the Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world, God loves you, that He gave His only begotten Son, that's Jesus Christ, okay, who went to the cross for you, who died on the cross for your sins, who took on your sins, died and was buried three days later, rose again from the dead, praise God. But the most important part says that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It doesn't say whosoever is baptized shall have everlasting life. It doesn't say whosoever shall go to church and have everlasting life. It doesn't say whosoever lives a clean and good life shall have everlasting life. No, it doesn't say you have to repent of your sins to have everlasting life. No, it says whosoever believeth in him shall have, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay? If you think you're going to heaven because I'm a good person, look at me. Look, that's not going to get you to heaven. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. Hey, what's required of you is to believe on Jesus Christ. To put all your faith, 100%, all your trust on Jesus Christ. That He died for your sins. That it's not of works. That it's not of baptism. That it's not of church attendance. It's not of whatever else you thought it was. It was paid 100% on Jesus Christ. You put your faith on Him. You call upon the name of the Lord. And thou shalt be saved, the Bible says. Okay? If you do that, and you can be sure that you can have eternal life. You can be sure that you're on your way to heaven because of what Jesus did for you. Okay? That's why he came. You know, 2,000 years ago, born in the manger. Now, before I keep reading, can you guys, you guys are in Matthew 4, right? Can you go to John chapter 8? Go to John chapter 8. Keep your finger there in Matthew 4. Go to John chapter 8. Because I want you to understand why did Jesus not turn the stone into bread? Look at John chapter 8, verse 28. John chapter 8, verse 28. It says here, Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He, and that I do not, look at this, and I do nothing of myself, but as my Father have taught me, I speak these things. Hey, when Jesus Christ came, He did nothing of Himself. What that means is, He didn't do anything that the Father did not ask Him to do. Okay, so who asked Him to turn the stone into bread? The devil, the tempter. It wasn't asked of the Father. Obviously, if God the Father asked Him to do that, He would have carried that out. Okay, and then in verse 29 it says, And He that sent me is with me, the Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please Him. And Jesus was concerned that everything He would do would please God the Father. Hey, that's the same as us. Alright, the devil comes tempting you, you ought to say like Jesus said, for I do always those things that please Him, that please God. Now I know we don't always, because we fail, because we have weaknesses, because we sin. Nevertheless, it should be our goal. It should be our purpose to do things that please God the Father. And even though I mentioned that baptism does not save you, that church attendance does not save you, you know what pleases the Father? That we are in church. It pleases the Father that we do baptize believers. That's why we do it. Okay? It's not about me. 
It's not about Pastor Kevin. It's not about anyone else except to give God all the glory. To please Him. Go back to Matthew chapter 4, please. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. So how does Jesus answer to Satan? It says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Listen. You know what Jesus did? He quoted Old Testament scripture. Now this is what you need to do, guys. Because I know you're made of the same flesh and blood as me. I know you suffer the same temptations that I suffer. I know you have the same sins that every man struggles with, that every woman struggles with, okay? But this is what you do. If you say to me, I'm not having victory over my sin, and I'm still struggling with the same sins time and time again, what do you do? What do you do? You memorize scripture. You memorize the Bible. Hey, look, Jesus here is quoting scripture, right? He's quoting, um, I don't know if I have the reference. Yeah, I do. He's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. I'll just read it to you. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. It says, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord, doth man live. You want to overcome sin in your life? You memorize scripture about the sin that you struggle with. Okay? If you're struggling with lying, you know, you struggle with, with lying, not telling the truth, then memorize, is it commandment number seven? I can't remember right now. You know, um, thou shalt not bear false witness. Memorize that. Okay? And when you're tempted to lie, you can quote that scripture. That's going to feed the spirit of God in you. That's going to feed your spirit, the new man. And, and, and uh, give you at least some level of victory in your life. Okay? That's what you do. But notice what Jesus said. Man shall not live by bread alone. Hey, you know what's just as important as your daily food? As your daily bread? What's just as important? What's compared to the bread there? The, uh, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You say, where do I get that from? Where do I get every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God? Do I have to go to a high mountain? Do I need to go to a forest and seek God's voice and God's wisdom in the... No! It's right here. It's right there in the Bible. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God has been recorded for us in the 66 books of the Bible. Right here. And that you know what that means? If you've not read this book cover to cover, you're going to struggle with sin. Okay? You need to make sure that you learn to read the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Every word of God is your food for the Spirit that's going to give you victory over temptation. Okay? So let me encourage you guys, if you've not read the Bible cover to cover, we're approaching a new year very soon, right? 2019. Set it in your mind from 2019, I'm going to read my Bible cover to cover. From January 1st, to December the 31st, we're going to read the Bible cover to cover once, maybe twice, whatever. Look, it's your spiritual food. You need to know what the Word of God says. Okay? And remember, Jesus says every word. You can't go, well, you know, Leviticus, that's a bit rough. I'm going to skip that book. Or Ezekiel. What's Ezekiel talking about? No, just read it. Okay? Just read it. Ask God to give you wisdom, to give you guidance. Look, if you don't understand what you're reading, just, just keep going. Just keep reading until you do find things that you do understand. Look, even if you don't understand it, the fact that you're reading it is still feeding the new man. It's still feeding the spirit that's within you. Okay? I mean, how many of you guys can remember what you ate last week? For Sunday. Sunday lunchtime. I mean, I can't, even, I can't remember what I ate. Okay? But obviously I ate something. Okay, I ate something and by eating that it nourished my body. Okay, I don't remember what it was, but it nourished my body. Hey, sometimes when you read your Bible, you're not going to fully understand what's being said. But somehow it's nourishing the spirit. 
It's nourishing the new man. So please, don't skip over parts of the Bible. Matthew chapter 4 verse 5. Matthew chapter 4 verse 5. Then the devil taketh him into an holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be, there's the doubts again, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up. Lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. So the devil here is quoting the Bible. He's quoting a psalm, though he doesn't quote it properly. Hey, this is another way the devil comes. He comes quoting the Bible to you. You know, and you can be fooled into believing false doctrine. You can be fooled into believing heresy. Okay? And you go, but no, it, it's based on the Bible. Look, the devil has Bible as well. Alright? And you need to know the word of God to know when you're being deceived. It's important. Because even Satan can use the Bible for his purposes. But again, why would Jesus not cast himself off? Why would he need to prove himself to be the Son of God? If not long ago, we know Jesus was baptized. And the Father said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Why does he have to doubt if the, if the Father already claimed that he was the Son of God? Just one chapter ago. Hey, there's no need to doubt the Word of God. And there's no need to listen to what Satan says. You know, the Father did not ask Jesus to throw himself um, uh, from, from the pinnacle of the temple. Let's keep reading. Verse number 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Wow. What an offer. Guys, what if the devil came to you and said, I'm going to give you all the riches you wanted. All the power, all the kingdoms of this world. Would you take it? It's pretty attractive. Well, all the money in the world, you know. Rich, powerful, you know. Yeah, look. I don't know how much of this is true. But I, I don't know how much power Satan has in this world. Obviously, he has a lot of power. Obviously, he controls a lot of the corrupt governments in this world. I'm not sure how much Satan is able to give. Okay? I'm not sure how powerful his kingdom is on this earth. Okay? And sometimes people read this and go, See, Satan controls all the kingdoms and all the governments. I mean, we don't really know that. It's not God telling us that. It's Satan claiming that he can give that away. And we know that Satan is the father of life. So I don't, I don't know if I can take him at face value. But obviously he does have some power. And if you guys are familiar with the, the celebrity world, Hollywood and music, you know, celebrities, you know, artists, music artists, rock stars and stuff. If you look at some of their testimonies of how they got famous, so many of them, so many of them say, I sold my soul to the devil. Somehow, they made a, an allegiance to the devil, and the devil gave them power, the devil gave them uh, popularity, the devil gave them the ability to play music. You know, that's, I mean, those are things that I've heard from their, from their mouths. And if I only heard one person say that, I'd be like, oh, what? But the fact is, so many of these, these famous celebrities and stars say the same thing. That they sold their soul to the devil. And so it looks like the devil is able to grant some power to people if you worship him. Okay? And we see this was the purpose at the end of the day. He wasn't concerned that Jesus was hungry. Okay? That wasn't his concern. All he wanted was to be worshipped. Okay? What the devil wants you to do at the end of the day is to not worship the Lord God of the Bible, but to worship him. Hey, look, and if you're not worshipping the God of the Bible, if you're not worshipping Jesus Christ, then by default, if you're worshipping someone, you're worshipping Satan. Okay? All these false religions, these false idols, idol worship and stuff that people do, hey, that worship is going to a devil. It's not going to the God of the Bible. Okay? Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Actually, 
keep your finger there, turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Now look. Jesus will one day take full control of the kingdoms of this world. Okay? Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Verse 15. Revelation 11, verse 15. When does Jesus take control of the kingdoms of this world? Look at this. And the seventh angel sounded. Hey, if you know the book of Revelation, you know that God pulls out his wrath by the seven trumpets and the seven vials. And it says here that, and the seventh angel trumpet sounded, the seventh trumpet, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hey, there's coming a time when Jesus will rule and reign on this earth in the millennium to come on this earth. It's going to be reigning. So Jesus obviously knows what's promising him. So we know that what Satan was offering was only a temporal thing, was not eternal. Notice that Jesus will reign forever and ever. Now look, when Satan, when the tempter comes and offers you things, <coughs> it's temporal. It's earthly. Okay? These celebrities that have their popularity, that sold their soul to the devil, it's temporal. A hundred years from now, no one's going to remember their names. A hundred years from now, if this earth continues, there's going to be other celebrities, other people people are looking up to. No one's going to remember those from 100, 200 years ago. It's temporal, okay? But if you follow up with God, His rewards, His treasures, eternal life is forever and ever, okay? You might be poor in this life, you might suffer in this life for His namesake, but His rewards are forever. Please do not trade the temporal things of this life. You know, the brand new car and the nice house. Don't trade those things for eternity. The mansions, the streets of gold that God has promised us forever and ever, okay? Verse number 10, Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Okay, so we see that Jesus resists the devil. Every time he was tempted, he quoted scripture. That's what you need to do. You need to learn scripture, memorize scripture, and quote it. Especially for the sins that you struggle with. The temptations that come your way and you struggle with. Okay. Now, I'm going to read to you from James chapter 4 verse 7. James chapter 4 verse 7. It says this. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He will flee from you. Look at Matthew 4.11 again. Matthew 4.11, and look. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. And Jesus Christ submitted himself to God the Father. He resisted the devil, and the devil fled from him. That's the example that we need to follow. When we're tempted to sin, okay? We submit ourselves to God, to His Word, we resist the devil, and He's going to flee from you. At least for a while. Okay, at least for a while, you have spiritual victory. But notice in verse 11, it says, And the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. That's ministered unto Jesus. But God the Father sent angels to Jesus to minister. That means to serve him. Okay? No doubt, they brought him food. They brought him the nourishment he needed. Okay, Jesus saw out his period of temptation, and now God the Father provided his needs. And instead of listening to the devil, he knew that God would answer the prayer. Okay, he would answer his needs, and God the Father definitely came, sent the angels, and ministered unto him. Okay, guys. Sometimes, like I said, when the Spirit of God is leading us, just go. Okay, because God will send his angels, as it were, and minister unto you, will give you your every need. Alright, I mean, you guys know that we're based in Queensland. Alright, 
uh, you know, and I had to leave my full-time work to get up there. And, you know, I, I prepared myself the best as I could financially. And you know what? God has provided my every need. You think I really wanted to come down to Sydney every week? You know, I, I could tell it was going to be difficult, right? I could tell. But the Holy Spirit was leading me, you know? It was leading you guys to be part of this church. And yet we see the Lord has provided our every need as a church. Okay, praise God for the Lord that we serve. He knows our needs. He's going to provide for us. Now, <clears throat> what I want you to do is, is uh, turn to Isaiah. If you've got the Old Testament, turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Okay, Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. I want to read to you a part of Isaiah, okay? And I just want you to think about what we're reading, okay? Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. The Bible reads, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as it was in her vexation, uh, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walk in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them have the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood. For this shall be with burning and, with, and fuel of fire. Now, we're reading that, you're probably wondering, what is this? What are you, what are you reading? Like, I don't know, are you, are you wondering that? You know, we see that the land of Israel is in darkness, and that God will send a light. You saw that, right? Not just the Israelites, but it said in verse 1, in Galilee of the nations. Hey, the word nations is the word Gentiles. Okay? Well, what is that about? Well, look at verse number 6. For. Okay, for is a conjunction. Or because. Because of what we just read. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And that's a very popular verse, right? Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. We know that's about the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you're just reading your Bible, okay, you're just going through your Old Testament, and you read those first five verses, you're probably going, what is that? What is that about, right? I know what 6 and 7 is about, but I don't know what 5, 1 to 5 is. Go back to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 verse 12. Matthew chapter 4 verse 12. Because it's quoted here now. It's quoted. What we just read in Isaiah 9 is quoted here. In Matthew 4 verse 12, it says, And when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. Remember this Galilee in Isaiah? And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, and in the borders of Zebulun and Nazareth. Uh, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, what we just read, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region of the shadow of death, light is sprung up. Okay? So, we see that when the book of Matthew was written, it's taken into consideration many, many prophecies of the Old Testament. Prophecies from hundreds of years before Jesus would be born. Okay? And what we see in Isaiah 9 is a fulfillment in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus would go through this region, bringing the, obviously Jesus Christ is the light, but bringing the light of the gospel into these areas. 
Look, the only reason I want to show you that is just to show you how important the Old Testament is. Hey, read the New Testament, know the New Testament, and then when you go back and you read the Old Testament, you'll be like, wow, this is stuff that I found that I read in the New Testament. And you see how much Christ fulfilled in the Scriptures. You know, the Bible is an, um, an amazing, miraculous book. Okay, always pointing us to Jesus Christ. Even when you don't think it's about Jesus, it usually is somehow. All right, it usually is. All right, now, what I want you to notice there is um, in verse number, uh, verse number, sorry, just bear with me. Okay, I'm, I'm missing some of my notes, but that's okay. I want to notice in verse 15, it said, Galilee of the Gentiles. Okay, of the Gentiles. Now also, um, sorry, just stay with me, let me just, I've, I've lost my point. Well, uh, it's going to be later on as well. But I just want you to notice that when Jesus Christ came, there's a false teaching that says he came for the Jews. And what they mean by that is that he came only for the Jews. And then what they teach is, because the Jews rejected Christ, then he went to the Gentiles. And then he decided, hey, I'm going to offer myself for the Gentiles. But I want you to notice that from Isaiah, it was promised that he would come to the Jews and to the Gentiles and to the nations. Hey, Jesus Christ, as the Lamb of God, came to die for all mankind. Okay? The Jews are not more important than the Gentiles. The Gentiles are not more important than the Jews. We're all the same. Okay? We all go to heaven the same way, by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, I'm going to read to you, okay, from John chapter 5. Verse 46. If you want to turn there, you can. John chapter 5, verse 46. Because there's so much confusion today about Israel and the Jews. And people today still call them the chosen of God. They still call them the chosen people of God. Today, 2,000 years later, okay, most of them have their own religion, Judaism. And Judaism rejects Jesus. They hate Jesus Christ. And let me tell you something. If you hate the Lord Jesus Christ, if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, your destination is hell. And the children of God will never go to hell. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Okay? And this is important because a lot of people think today that the Jews worship God the Father. They say, yes, he rejects Jesus, but they worship God the Father. You know, they believe the Old Testament writings. And we saw the Old Testament writings point us to Jesus. So do they really believe the Old Testament writings? Look at it in, in John chapter 5, verse 46. John chapter 5, verse 46. Jesus speaking to the Jews. He said, for had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me. For he wrote of me. And if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? You know what Jesus is saying there? If you even believe Moses, if you believe the writings of Moses and the writings of the Old Testament prophets, if you believe them, then you would have believed me. The fact that Judaism today rejects Jesus means they do not believe Moses. It means they don't believe the Old Testament scriptures. Because as we saw in Isaiah, the Old Testament scriptures point us to Jesus. Okay? You cannot say I believe in the Old Testament and reject Jesus. That is a false religion that will send you to hell because you're rejecting the Lamb of God, which is taken away the sin of the world. There's no other way to have your sins forgiven and taken away except through Jesus Christ. Verse 17. Verse 17. Matthew 4, 17. Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
Hey, we're not at hand lead. It means it's close by, right? It's close by. It's almost upon you. Hey, when we go out and we preach the gospel, when we knock doors and we say, hey, do you know you're going to heaven? You know what we're essentially saying is that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right here. You give me five minutes, I can show you right now from the Bible how you can be sure of going to heaven. And if there's anyone here that is not sure they're going to heaven, please speak to me after the service or speak to someone else you know, after the service so you can be sure that you're going to heaven. The King of Heaven is at hand. We can take it today if you want. Okay, it's available today. Now, please go to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. Because people will say, this is another false teaching. They'll say, no, no, no. When Jesus came, he came preaching another gospel. They'll say, he came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. That's what I'll say. Instead of saying that, you know, I'll say, we, when we go out soul winning, we preach the gospel of grace. But the, the Jews, they need the gospel of the kingdom. Look, it's the same gospel. Okay? How do you enter in the kingdom? You must be born again. You must be saved. Look at Galatians 1 6. Galatians 1 verse 6. I marvel, says Paul. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. For though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if anyone preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Guys, there's one gospel. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me. Salvation, the gospel, is through his shed blood. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. If people come and say, well, hold on, Jesus preached another gospel than Paul, then what do they say about Jesus? That he's accursed. That Jesus was preaching another gospel. Look, please be very careful about who you listen to, the preachers you're listening to. If they preach as more than one gospel, let them be accursed. Okay? There is one gospel. The gospel of the kingdom is the same gospel as the gospel of grace. Okay? It's the same gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ. Go back to Matthew 4. Matthew 4 verse 18. Matthew 4 verse 18. I'll, I'll try to hurry up a little bit. Matthew chapter 4 verse 18. It says, And Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, cast in a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Hey, these are two brothers, uh, Peter and Andrew. And it was a full-time work to be fishermen. Okay? Now look at verse 19. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Hey, instead of you fishing for fish, you're going to go fish for men, for the souls of men. Look at verse 20. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Uh, it's a bit of a funny story, right? Two guys fishing, Jesus walking along. Hey, come and follow me. Leave your nets. And they leave the nets and straightway follow him. Hey, they leave their full-time jobs and they follow after Jesus. And you go, that's crazy. You know, if, if someone came along asking you to give up your job and follow him, would you do it? <laughs> well, here's the thing. Um, this, isn't the, this isn't the first time that Jesus met Andrew and Peter. Okay? They knew, they already knew who he was. It's not like they decided, oh, let's just follow a man. No, no, no. They knew he was the Son of God. They knew he was the Messiah. Turn with me to the book of John. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Verse 35. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 35. So this was before what we just read. Okay? John chapter 1, verse 35. It says, Again, 
The next day after John stood and two of his disciples, this is John the Baptist, and looking unto Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say you've been interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? <coughs> he saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So Andrew has already spent a day with Jesus. Okay? And look at this, verse 41. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, the Christ. Hey, we found the Christ. We found the Messiah. We found the Anointed One. We found the Promised One. Verse 42. And he brought him, that's brought Peter, to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is an interpretation, a stone. So we, so we see what played out before, okay? They already knew who Jesus was. They knew he was the Lamb of God. They knew he was the Messiah. Then later on, as they're working their full-time jobs, Jesus comes walking past. And they leave all their things and they follow after Christ. Okay? I hope that gives you a bit more context and not thinking, wow, these guys are pretty foolish. Who are they following? You know what I mean? If he was some other guy, some false Christ, they have followed him. No. They really had confirmed by John the Baptist that this would be the Lamb of God. Okay? Now, I do want to say this very quickly. Okay? <clears throat> because there are Christians that think. When they, when they read about the disciples leaving their nets, leaving their full-time jobs, and following after Christ, there are Christians, very foolishly, that think, well, I'm just going to leave my full-time job. I'm just going to leave my work, and I'm going to follow Christ. Okay? And they leave their full-time jobs. They can't provide for themselves. They can't provide for their families. Do you think that's what God wants from them? To leave their work? You know, the Bible repeats time and time again that for the man, for the husband of the house, for the head of the house, the father, to provide for his family, to work. You read that in the Old Testament. You read about that in the New Testament. So how do we make sense of what we read here? It's very easy, guys. And this is something, as we go through Matthew, that I want you to understand, is that many of the things Jesus teaches are to his disciples. Okay, do you know what a disciple is? A disciple is a follower of a man. Okay? When Jesus Christ was on this earth for those three years of ministry, he had disciples following after him. They left their jobs, they left their families. They had a limited time to hear Jesus. And many of his, his disciples became the leaders of the New Testament churches. Alright? Now, they followed Jesus. Jesus, and, and Jesus provided for them, okay? Obviously, we know Jesus performed miracles. He fed the 5,000 with two loaves and five fishes. I think it is, okay? So we know Jesus could provide supernaturally, but there were also thousands of people following after them, giving of, their need, giving of themselves ministry to the, to the disciples and Jesus Christ, okay? So you need to be careful when you read the Bible is not to go, wow, look at the disciples. I want to be like that, no. The word disciples is only mentioned in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts. When you read the epistles of the church, to the church, okay, and you read the epistles to, you know, the pastors like Timothy and Titus, the word disciple is not found there, okay? And you're going to find time and time again the importance for men to work hard jobs, to work jobs and provide for their families, okay? Because the time for discipleship is over. That was during the time... Jesus was on the earth, okay? But just because that's the truth, we can still take applications and apply that today for us. We can still take it. Now, let me give you an example of this. Even though Jesus is not physically walking the earth, the body of Christ is still here. What is the body of Christ on the earth? Anybody? The body of Christ? Jesus? No, it's not Jesus. The church. The church. 
church is the body of Christ. Okay? So, if your church says to you, and it's not going to happen here because we just haven't got the finances, but you know, if we ever get to a point and your church asks of you, hey, can you serve full time in the church? You know, we'll provide for your family, we'll provide for your finances, this will be your full time job. You know, can you leave your full time job that you have and come and serve in the church? Then, yes, at that point, you know that the church, the body of Christ, is going to provide for you. So we can take that application to the church, okay? If the church is going to provide for you and your family, then yes, you can leave your jobs and serve the church in a full-time ministry. Whether that's a pastor, a deacon, maybe an evangelist or a missionary or whatever, that's where you can apply these principles and apply that today, okay? Please, I never want to come across someone like you guys. You ring me up, Pastor Ken, I decided to leave my full-time job and serve Christ. I'd be like, you idiots, go back to church, go back to work and provide for your family. Because that's the instruction that we see throughout the rest of the Bible. Okay? First Timothy chapter 5 verse 8. First Timothy chapter 5 verse 8 says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he have denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Hey, if you don't work and provide for your own, provide for your own family, the Bible says you're worse than an infidel. You're worse than an unbeliever. Okay, so please, you know, be mindful when you read through the Gospels, we already spoke about it, Jesus is not always preaching to believers, sometimes he's preaching to non-believers, sometimes he's preaching to false teachers, sometimes he's preaching to reprobates, okay? But the teachings that he gave to his disciples are first and foremost to those that left everything and followed after Christ, okay? That's not how you get saved. Salvation is not follow Jesus. Hey, I tell you, who became a disciple and followed Jesus? Judas Iscariot. Do you think becoming a disciple saved your soul? No, Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus. Okay? Salvation is not by following Jesus. Salvation is by believing on Jesus Christ. By trusting His death, burial, and resurrection. Hey, Judas Iscariot followed Jesus. Judas Iscariot was a disciple. Okay? But he did not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his downfall. Okay? And if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I will say to you, hey, follow Him. Follow the commandments that we see in the Word of God. But whether you follow it or not, how well you do it or not, is not going to determine whether you're saved or not, whether you're going to heaven or not, because it's all been paid for by Jesus Christ and His sacrifice. Okay? Let's wrap it up now. We're going to go back to Matthew 4. Matthew 4, thank you for your patience so far. Matthew 4. Verse 23, Matthew 4, verse 23. The Bible says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogue, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. There it is. Hey, when he said, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he said, Preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Okay? And healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria. Hey, what's Syria? That's a Gentile uh, nation. Okay, the Syrians. And brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee. Hey, that's, that's Israel. From the capitalists, hey, the capitalists um, is a Gentile region, and that D D E C the capitalists, that that that's ten. It's ten Gentile cities. People from ten Gentile cities were following Jesus, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. Hey, I just want to end on this. The people that came following Jesus, they were Jews, yes, but they were Gentiles as well. And Jesus accepted them. He healed them. He preached to them. He cast out devils. Jesus Christ came for the Jews and for the Gentiles. Please remember that. Please, you're not a second class citizen in the eyes of God. He came for the Gentiles as much as he came for the Jews. Alright, let's pray guys.